everybody, my name is Andy, and I'm going to do a stream on creating a NES emulator using Python 3. So, yeah, welcome to the stream. This is going to be pretty based off the current uh, emulator being created by Ferris, who's doing it in Rust and doing it for Nintendo 64, which I thought was super cool. So I thought I'd do the same thing, but do it a bit simpler. So do it for the NES, which is obviously a lot of a bit of an older system. It's going to be a lot easier to do. Allow us to have a bit more fun with the language in particular, and it's going to be focusing on Python three. So, what are the features of Python three that I'm kind of looking to to come into? So, I am coming from a background of doing a lot of Python two development. I've never really messed around with Python 3, so I thought I'd come into it and do a bit of a series where we look at things like type hinting. So I might just pull up a Sublime window here. I've got the font sizes bumped up a bit, so this hopefully should be, be easy to read. So the idea will be to focus a bit on Python 3, like I said, and to get things like type hinting. So to give an example of what that's going to look like. So in Python 2, or and in Python 3, you do not have static typing. What they have added in Python 3.5 is support for inline type hinting. So what this allows us to do is to say, instead of saying argument 1, print arg1, Instead, we can say arg1 is of type integer or string or object or whatever we desire. So there's nothing in the Python uh, interpreter that's actually going to read and ensure that this is correct. But it does mean that a linter can come through and take a look at it and make sure that all our object types are aligned. Um, other things like advanced unpacking seems pretty cool. Command line arguments are done a bit better in Python 3.2. There's keyword only arguments and function calls. Generators and iterators have been redone, so everything is now an iterator if you're coming from a Python 2 background, or the uh, standard library things that is. And generators now have some new syntax, including yield from. There's built in enums and things like mix-ins. Mix-ins were actually part of Python 2, but whatever, it wasn't there until many of them. Anyway, cool. So what are we actually gonna be doing in this? So the hope that I have is to write a NES emulator. Uh, so I have looked into this a bit before, uh, and I have done some just kind of quick looking around at what what was involved in the NES and kind of how to make an emulator. So to give some background, I have never made an emulator before, so this is going to be my first shot at it. We'll see how it goes. But I think the uh, I have done some CPU development before. Uh, in that, sorry, some CPU emulation before. So I've done some MIP assembly programming and created a a CPU to emulate running those instructions. So I have a bit of familiarity with that, but I've never done any NEST stuff before or any full emulation. So we'll see how we go and what happens. Basically, the idea is I would just want to be doing all the Python coding on stream. Um, I do have a repository set up for this, which is just a empty repository. It doesn't have any code or anything in it at the moment, just some readme's and stuff like that. Uh, and yeah, today just look into what the NES is, find some information about it, and start coding up a CPU emulator, potentially. Um, kind of the goal here is going to be to document the process of making an emulator, a pretty simple one, hopefully, uh, and just learn some of the new features of Python 3. Obviously, if you've never used Python before, then it could also be a good way to learn Python. Uh, yeah, what do we want to do? We want to make it work. So ideally, that's going to be the end product is something that works. There are plenty of other NES emulators out there. 
Uh, there are even nest emulators out there written in Python. So there's no uh, great great value to this, I would say, with the exception of learning. So, but look, we'll learn and see what we can see what we can make. Hopefully, have some fun and yeah, see where this takes us. The idea is not to have it be something that is going to be uh, particularly fast. To be honest, I'm not really focusing on performance, just getting it worked or feature filled or anything like that. Uh, yeah, one last thing would be obviously uh, creating an emulator. You need to use ROMs and the downloading and piracy and stuff like that of ROMs is kind of something that is definitely illegal and that Nintendo polices, so please don't post any illegal ROMs or links to places where you can find ROMs or stuff like that. And if you're going to be using an emulator, only use ROMs that you have ripped yourself. Cool. All right, let's go take a look at the emulator and see what we can find out. Uh, sorry, at the NES and see what we can emulate, I should say. So this is the Nintendo Entertainment System. So kind of what, what it <clears throat> what it is, is a video game console that was released in the 80s, yeah, in 1985. And basically, at its core, it's got a 8-bit CPU. So I have looked into some of this stuff, so I might just go through what I've kind of looked at. It's got an 8-bit CPU, which was made by these guys, by Rico, the 2A03, but really at its core, it's this MOS Technology 6502 CPU. So this is going to be what we're going to try emulating today. Uh, now, I might just open up the sketchbook. Cool. And I might just do some of the basics, just a bit of a walkthrough of the basics of what an emulator does and how we can, how we can, yeah, how we can do it. Cool. So what is the NES? So I'm going to do some bad drawings over here, but so the NES is going to be, excuse the blocks. So if this is our NES, it's going to have several components. So the first one is going to be the original one that we're going to do. To create an emulator, you need to simulate each part of these components. So the first one, going to be a CPU. The second part over here is the essentially the graphics card. It is called the PPU, which is the picture processing unit. But this is the things that the CPU can push bits to, or you know, push information to, and the PPU will render this on a screen, or render this in some way. So essentially the equivalent of a modern day graphics card. So all pretty standard. On the side here, we will have our memory. Um, now, this is going to be, well, I should call this our RAM, I suppose, which is just going to be able to store a lot of, a lot of bytes. Now, everything that I'm going through here is kind of off the top of my head, so all of this is going to be rather approximate, but the answer is the CPU, which is this thing here, is going to be an 8-bit CPU for a NES. I'll kind of come back to this and explain what this means, but we're going to have an 8-bit CPU, and we have 2 kilobytes of RAM. Uh, and I don't actually know what the specs of the PPU are. I guess that's going to be something we're going to find out. And the idea is with the NES is that a lot of the data, most of the data actually, that the CPU gets from is going to come in off 
a cartridge which you put into the console which is going to be read only memory which is why we call it a ROM and so that's what the ROM part of a NES game is and so that's going to give us all the data about not only the code to play the game but also any of the data that's on the game so you know what's the configuration of a in the case of Super Mario Bros what's the configuration of a Mario sprite it's a little person but also what are the code what is the code that we need to run so that you know it'll have assembly instructions on here Cool, so that's kind of what the emulator overall is going to look like. So what we are making is the NES. So what we're going to do is we're going to emulate a CPU. So we're going to have something that can read in instructions that are going to be loaded from the ROM. It's going to be able to interpret them. So it's going to read them in in hex, turn them into things that the CPU can understand. It's going to be storing values in RAM and also in registers, which kind of just another bit of storage over here um, and it's going to be tel telling the PPU what to do and what to draw so we're also going to have to simulate the PPU so and hook it up to some kind of graphics framework so we can actually see some output from that we're going to have to simulate the RAM so the memory and how that's all stored we're going to have to make things like a debugger and other things like that anyway so that's kind of the core of what a CPU uh, sorry of what the NES is and what we're going to be doing at the start, at least for today, is going to be looking at the CPU and how we can simulate, yeah, make one of them. So it's going to, how it can read instructions in and interpret that code and turn it into useful instructions. All right. Question. The cartridge didn't have its own RAM. That is a great question. I have no idea. Let's find out. So the reality is a ROM cartridge. The reality is a lot of these questions I'm not going to know the answer to, which is kind of why I'm going to be learning it all on the spot. So let's find out. ROM. So I'm using Safari here with the text size bumped up a bit, but I might bump it up a bit more and see if that makes it any easier. Design. Um, all right, I don't know the answer to that, but kind of looking at this, my, my thought would be no. I believe there is some, on the NES, there is some persistent RAM. Oh, that's true. Maybe on the, yeah, there is on the cartridge because I think you can save things to the cartridge. You can have save files and stuff that are kind of in a, a long-term storage. But to be honest, yeah, here we go. So some cartridges have battery back static random access memory, allowing you to save game data for progress or scores between saves. Um, that's a great point. So in this diagram down here, I suppose if I come back to this color, we will also have a small amount of RAM that the computer, that the CPU can write to, to save things such as game state. Thank you. Como andas? Cool. All right, so I might drill down onto what this CPU is and explain a bit further about what 8-bit means and all this kind of stuff. So, so if you've done any CPU work before, all of this is going to be fairly familiar to you. If you haven't, well then, this might be a bit uh, a bit difficult to follow along, but I'll try and take it a bit slow and see what we can do. I might just... Is there a way to increase this canvas size? Potentially. New. I might as well save it. Cool. All right. So, what is the CPU? So, this is kind of going to be a bit of a bit of a structure about what a CPU does. 
Hi, the coat, the coat god. Hello, welcome. Thanks for coming along. So, uh, yeah. So the nest structure uh, has this six five zero two CPU. So the six five zero two CPU, which we'll come look at here, is made by Moss Technology, Rockwell Cinetech. Anyway, so the point of it is. It's a old 8-bit microprocessor, and it basically it runs its own version of assembly code. Uh, I'll kind of explain what these things mean. Um, kind of try to do it a bit step by step. So what is a CPU? So a CPU is... Well, great question. I'm going to answer that fa in a fairly simplistic manner. A CPU is a piece of hardware that sits on the board. Uh, sits on a on a um, chipboard like the Nest, for instance. It'll be one of the components on there. And the goal, uh, the sorry, the role of the CPU is to kind of be the brain of the computer. So it's going to interpret instructions from the operating system, potentially, or from the user. And it's going to communicate communicate with things like our memory. It's going to read data from things like our ROMs, which in the Nest's case is a cartridge. This is going to be our memory. And it also communicates with things like the picture processing unit. So the CPU is the thing that does all the interpreting and telling other things what to do. Uh, yeah, also, if you do have any questions, feel free to chuck them out. I'm kind of coming at this with a bit of background knowledge, but to be honest, I'm going to be learning on the fly. So, yeah, anything you want to chuck out, feel free to ask. Uh, so how do how do we talk to the CPU? Also, the C I should mention this now. I'll draw it over here. The CPU also maintains some internal memory called registers. Registers. Whoa. Um, so in the case of the six five zero two, there are actually three registers. So three bytes of data that it can store, and they're called X, Y, these are terrible letters, but you get the point, X, Y, and A. So what these registers are, are ways for the CPU to, instead of having to store data in the RAM, which is quite slow to get data from the RAM, it can just store single, small amounts of data in these registers, which are located I presume physically located on the CPU. I'm not actually sure how that works. But anyway, uh, some kind of low latency memory that you can access and quickly do things with. And so most of the commands that are in the uh, assembly language, which is the language used to speak to the CPU, are going to be dealing with pushing data or pulling data from these registers. Cool. What is uh, memory? So memory, the RAM is just a way of storing lots of bytes. Registers are a way of storing a single byte, but really quickly. Cool. So how do we actually um, speak to this CPU? So CPUs, and this is where it's going to get a bit more technical. So CPUs understand, well, understand. CPUs can read in instructions, but they actually can only read in binary. So they can only read in zeros and ones. So a typical instruction stream that might get sent to a CPU is going to look something like, you know, zeros, zeros and ones all the way down, so on and so forth. And to a human, that's fairly uninterpretable. But to the CPU, it's going to know what this means based off an instruction set, which in this case is the 6502 instruction set. which basically just defines what configuration of 1 and 0 can the CPU read in and understand. And the way that a human can understand all of this is something called assembly. So what is assembly? So this, this right here, these 1s and zeros we call binary. And what is assembly? So assembly is a fixed set of instructions that allow us, much in the same way that Python is a programming language, assembly defines a programming language that we can use. 
unlike Python, it is quite low level. So instead of things like calling a print function or you know setting up a function declaration, typically things in assembly are going to be single instructions that have one very specific purpose. So for instance, an example instruction might be, I'm going to write this in pseudocode, but load a value, for instance, x uh, 7 into the register x, which is this register up here. So we want to be able to tell the CPU, hey, we want to load a value into a register or into memory or send it to the picture processing unit or something. So how do we do that? So assembly defines a spec of instructions that we can use that will allow us to send commands like this. So for instance, this command in 6502 assembly, which is the programming language we're going to be using, is going to look something like load x. So this is just the syntax that it would use. And you can load the number 7. So this is an example of a 6502 instruction that we might use, which is going to load the number 7 into the register x. There's other commands, obviously, that you can use. There's around 150 commands, I believe, that we're going to have to implement at some point, which are going to be, uh, which is going to be fun, but there are some common characteristics, and this is a pretty simple CPU, so there's actually not that many. Um, so how does the CPU, so this is what the program is going to write then. So this is a kind of a very low level language, but still understandable by humans. We can kind of read that and say we know what it's going to do. So how do we turn that into something that the computer is going to know how to read, which is zeros and ones? So basically there will be a compiler, which is going to turn this command into binary. And it's going to be do that by using the 6502 specification. So it will look at this, which is in assembly, and will say, how can I turn that into, into binary? And basically it will say, well, I know that the code for load x is 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. I don't actually know the code, but let's pretend that it's that. And the value of number 7 in binary is uh, 1, 1, 1. And then it'll pad some zeros here so it knows what it's talking about. So basically, if you look at this stream of binary, this is going to be the first thing saying, hey, we're going to load an instruction. And this is going to be the next thing saying, hey, we're going to load the number 7. Cool. Uh, so why do we have to pad stuff with this? So I'm just going to keep going deeper down this rabbit hole until we kind of get to what are we actually trying to implement here. So Look, let me know if you don't understand anything or if you have any questions, but uh, this is going to be the basic, basic way I'm going to do it. And then once I've got through this, we'll start looking at the nest more specifically and start looking at actual code and so on and so forth. Cool. All right. Let's do another one. So with that in mind, what's the next step going to be? So we know that the nest has an 8-bit CPU. So again, what does what does an 8-bit CPU mean? So typically, <coughs> when we're talking about computers, 8-bits uh, can also be referred to as one byte. So there are 8 bits to a byte, and there's going to be a, a in this when I refer to one byte, I'm going to mean 8 bits. So what does 8 bits mean? So 8 bits actually means 8 binary digits. So for instance, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 is a number represented in binary that is 8 bits wide, or has 8 bits, I suppose. And this corresponds to the number 0. I'm not going to go into binary, um, to be honest. There are obviously some good resources out there for learning binary, but I'll go the theory of what 8-bit means. So this is one potential value that you can store in 8 bits. Another potential value might be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, which is going to represent the number 2. So you can see that there's going to be all these possibilities of numbers that we can store. 
and so we think, all right, what is the biggest number we can store? One, 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 one. What is this number? So the biggest number that you can represent with eight bits or eight binary things is going to be 255. What did it say? 255, yeah. Uh, it's 255. So you can represent the number zero all the way up to 255, which means there are, I might use a different color for this, there are 256 possible values that you can represent using 8 bits. Or another way of saying that is there are 256 potential values you can represent using one byte. Cool, so what does that mean for us? So what we're saying here is that if this is an 8-bit CPU, what this means is basically we're going to be reading in, when we're reading in binary code, we're going to be reading in 8 bits at a time, or 8 zeros and 1s at a time, which is also going to be called 1 byte. So we're reading in 1 byte at a time, and typically everything operates off a 1 byte system. So every register can only store 1 byte, or 8 bits. Every location in memory, so in RAM, can only store 8 bits or 1 byte, so it can only store 256 values. So basically, a register can be from 0 to 200, any value from 0 to 255. A entry in the RAM can only be 0 to 255, so on. So, and if it's communicating, this is how it does it. So this is going to be an important concept, is this 8-bit 1 byte. Um, there's another part to this, which is hexadecimal. So, again, I'm probably not going to explain too much of the concept of what hexadecimal is, but I'll, I'll go over it briefly. So, hexadecimal is a base 16 system. And what that means is that a binary is going to be base 2. We've got decimal, which is the number system we typically use normally, is going to be base 10. And we've got hex is going to be... 16, base 16. So what that means is that you can use one digit to represent any number up until 16. So if we were to count up from 0 in hexadecimal, it would be 0, 1, 2, 3, so on and so forth, 9. And instead of going to 10 here, like we would in decimal, which you'll notice a 10 is two digits. So instead of 10 transitioning to two digits, we have special characters. So A represents the number 10 in decimal, B represents the number 11, C, 12, so on and so forth, D, E, F. And so F represents the number 15, and then to represent the number 16 in hexadecimal, you would just write 1, 0. So 1, 0 in hexadecimal represents the number 16 in decimal, which represents the number 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, or maybe one less zero, but you get the point. So there are different ways of writing numbers depending on the number system. They all mean the same thing, they're just different ways of writing it. Um, now why is hexadecimal important? Hexadecimal is important because all the ROMs are going to come just as a collection of, of hex. Um, and why do ROMs use hex? So if we're using a 8-bit system, one thing that we'll notice is that the largest number that we can store is 255, which you can see in decimal takes up three digits to write. In hexadecimal, to go from the range 0 to 255, excuse me, you can write the number 0 can be written as 0 in hex. Typically you write hex as 0x and then your hexadecimal number. Um, and the biggest number that we can write is going to be 0xff. So this is our biggest in two digits. It's going to be f and f corresponds to the number 255, which is the number we found here. Cool. So what does that mean? It just means that we can write anything in any number up to 255 takes 8 bits to write in binary, which is what we're going to use normally. And you can also represent that as 2. Uh, any value from 0 to 255 can be represented in 2 hex characters.
Cool, so what does that mean? It means that we want to use hex because it's going to be a lot easier for us to write, uh, to read instead of uh, decimal, uh, sorry, instead of binary because FF is a lot easier to read than 1111111. It's a lot less characters and it makes a lot more sense than decimal because we're aligned to it and there's a very clear, very clear mapping back to, uh, back to binary and all our ROMs are going to use it. Cool. So what that means is that every time we look at a, a value in a register or a value in memory, typically we're going to—it's going to store a value between zero and two hundred and fifty-five. We're just going to write every value that we see as a hex character, so FF or something. So basically, what I'm trying to say is that you can represent any value as eight with eight bits, or one byte, or two hex characters. can all be written the same way. Cool, uh, so there's plenty of other stuff to go into about how the CPU works, and I'll go back to that, but th there's more stuff to this, like how do you deal with overflow and stuff like that, but we'll come back to that later, that's all a bit, all a bit too far. All right, nice. Um, let me just take a look at what I was going to say. Cool. All right. I think at this point, yeah, it would be good to let's start looking at the nest. Let's start looking at the moss, and then let's start running some Python code. So what I do have here is I might just open up a ROM, um, which I have stored here. Now I'm using Sublime Text here, and uh, there is a plugin in Sublime Text called Hex Hex Viewer, which you can install, which is just this really cool uh, way of looking at hex code, and is going to be very helpful to us. Cool. So what is what is this? This is the Super Mario Brothers NES ROM. So it is a ROM, and this is what our, all our ROMs are going to look like. They are just a collection, so this is all our data in here. They're a collection of hex characters. And you can kind of see that we talked about earlier that hex characters, any two hex characters can represent eight bits. So if you look at the highlighting here, it's highlighting 4E. So what it's saying is that that is the first eight bits or one byte. And then four, five is gonna be the next one byte. So if we were a CPU, we would actually be reading in 4e as one step. The next thing we'd be reading in 4.5, then 5.3. So one cool thing about this hex inspector is that it shows us what is the binary. So it shows us that 4e actually represents the value 01001110. And it also tells us what the decimal value of that is, which is 78. So we have a 78 uh, value here in this first byte. And what does this app actually represent? So we're not in the code section of the ROM yet. We're just in the data section. And what does this represent? So we can see over here that the word 78, if you look up an ASCII chart, again, I'm not going to explain what ASCII is, but it's just, well, not in too much depth. It's a way of mapping numbers to characters. So we know that the number 78 corresponds to the letter N, the number 40, well, the hex number 45, corresponds to 69, which corresponds to the letter E, so on and so forth. And so we can see that it's written out NES here, the Nintendo Entertainment System, which is cool, because this is what we want. So we can see that this is a NES ROM, and then we can see that the rest of the data is either going to be program code, so it doesn't really have any meaning anymore in terms of, in terms of ASCII. These are going to be instructions that we're going to be reading in and trying to determine what they are and what they're trying to tell us. So this is what we're actually going to read in and turn into a, into, well, into something that works and can play Super Mario Brothers, ideally. Cool, all right. I'll go back to the Nintendo Entertainment System. So we're going to start by doing the CPU, and we might start going into some code now, into some Python code, um, and just, yeah, 
try and smash some stuff out. So the idea is that the MOS 6502, which is this, this thing, uses a an assembly language set for its own thing called the 6502 instruction set or something like that. And basically there's a table here on Wikipedia which lists all the possible instructions that you can write in this assembly language which will then be converted into valid code. Um, I'm not going to go through all these things and there's different ways of d things that do different things and they have different ways of addressing which memory to look at or which registers and stuff like that. But for now, screw that, let's just go do some Python and try and read in the ROM and start printing things out one byte at a time. Cool, so as I said, I've got a repo set up here called the Python NES. There's no code in it. Um, and I do use the PyCharm editor which I quite like. Um, obviously, it's not required. You can be able to, all this code will be uploaded, you'll be able to look at it in anything, but for now, I'm gonna be using that to do everything. So, what are we going to do? We'll create a new Python file. We're just gonna call it main for now, because we're very uncreative. Do I wanna add this to git? Yes. Cool, so, For starters, um, we've got to ensure that this is in Python 3, which at the moment, I do believe it is. Yes, it is. Um, but I might just set up a virtual environment so that we can run the code in that, and I'll just kind of show you how to do that. I'm not going to go into installing virtual environment and stuff like that. There are plenty of tutorials around, but the process, if you have virtual environment wrapper, is just going to be make virtual env nes. Uh, that's just going to install a Python 3.5.1 virtual environment, which is what we're going to use. Cool. And we now, if I deactivate this, um, I can use the work on command. So work on nest will activate that virtual environment and deactivate will deactivate it. So we now have a virtual environment where we can control the packages that are going to be installed and how things like that work. Uh, PyCharm, I'll just come into here, I'll go down to the project, and I'll just change the project interpreter to use the correct, uh, the correct one, so I'll add, I will add the virtual environment that we just created, which is going to be somewhere up here, uh, in users environments. Ah, yeah, there it is. So this is our virtual environment, and then we can just come down here, we'll go to bin, Python. Cool, all right, so we're now using the correct virtual environment. All right, I want to run this file, so I'll just do the standard, um, if name equals rain, run the main function. Def main, and we're just gonna print Hello world. So this is going to be our first Python 3 thing, if you're coming from Python 2 background, is that print is now a function, which is pretty cool. And it has some special syntax and stuff like that, but this will work. So calling print without the function brackets now, so calling it as an operator will no longer work and it'll give you a syntax error. Cool. All right, let's run main. All right. So we have run using our virtual environment. We have run this Python file. We can see hello world. So we now have a working Python program. It prints hello world, but that's all we want to do for now. Cool, so what do we want to do now? We want to read in the ROM. Um, so the two things that we're going to do here is one, we're going to do some command line arguments. So, <clears throat> we want to be able to pass in the location of the ROM so that we're not hard coding it so that anyone can run this and pass in their own ROM. And we also want to be able to open that file and start reading it in. So that's going to be doing some, some file stuff and some read lines. We want some command line arguments. 
and yeah, cool. Well, let's do that pretty quickly. So how do we do command line arguments in Python 3? So that has changed in Python 3.2. Um, again, I've just started, I've only recently transitioned to Python 3, so my knowledge of this kind of stuff is fairly lacking. So um, yeah, we're just gonna go look it up. I know that it exists, but I don't really know command line arguments. Uh, arg parse, no? Yeah, the Python 3 includes arg parse. So I think this has all been backported to Python 2.7, but running it natively in Python 3 seems cool. All right, and this will allow us to do on the command line to show help and to do stuff like this. Right, so here's our code. Um, I'm gonna be bad and I'm gonna copy and paste this and then just change it. Ideally, we should be understanding things, but for now, I'm gonna need to import the argpars package. It's an argument package description Ness emulator, and we're going to add one argument, which is just going to be the path path to ROM path to Ness ROM. Um, so now these kind of fields here. We're going to need to go and figure out what these mean, because I don't know what they mean. Cool. All right. Meta variable is going to tell us how it's going to be formatted in the um, add argument. Here we go. Cool. So this is kind of how it's going to go from here on in. I will just try to write some Python code to learn some things and try and focus on some of the Python 3 stuff. We should move pretty quickly and yeah, see where we go. Um, yeah, also if you have any comments or ideas, if, you haven't, if the text file size is too small or something, let me know and I'll try and bump it up or something. All right, um, God, this is some documentation. Type, cool, int. file type. Cool. So we can actually pass in a file. That seems cool. I'm not going to do that though. I'm just going to do things, do things manually. Um, we don't need more arguments, meta variable, whatever. We'll just call it ROM. Uh, and the type is going to be string. Parse args. Strings, is this how this works? Cool. So let's run that, see what we do. The following arguments are required. Ah, that is correct. We have added a ROM path thing. So we need to add this as a command line argument. So we can add this in here. And it's going to be in uh, my ROM. It's going to be in slash users slash andrew slash roms. I just have to verify that that is correct. And it's called smv.ness. So all we're doing here is passing in a path that can be used um, on the command line. Sweet. So you can see that we have an args object here, which has an object, which is a string called ROM path. Um, I'm not sure what this accumulate function does, to be honest, having not used this before. Ah, args.accumulate, that was there, I think, in the past, so this is kind of useful. So what we want is args. ROM path. So instead of printing hello word, we're going to print the ROM path. Cool. 
So we now have the path to our ROM. So what do we want to do now is... So... Let's just get some documentation going on here and then we can go forward from there. the args. We'll come back and make sure that this ROM path is correct later. For now I'm not gonna not gonna bother doing it. Alright, so I presume that file open in Python 3 is kind of similar to Python 2. We'll presume that we have some valid input for now. That may or may not be true. So we want to open, so this is kind of non-Python 3 syntax, but for those who haven't seen it before, you can, you could do something like file equals this. So this will open the file, um, and then you can read out, read out the data or whatever. And then when you're done with it, you close it, because otherwise you will have a hanging, you will have a, an open file which sticks around for the execution of your program, which isn't great. So the good way of doing this typically is going to be using this with syntax. So if we say with oops, with this as file, so now this will assign the opened file to a local variable called file, and then down in this indent here, we will be able to use it. So file dot read. And when this block goes out of scope, so for instance, when we come back to this code, when we come back to this line here, this file will be automatically closed because it will be taken out of scope. So it's just a nice way of managing IO is roughing something like this so you don't have to remember to close your files. Cool, so let's read lines. Cool, so Python, if you open a file, you can read the lines. Um, now, if I do print to file dot read lines, I presume that's going to work. Potentially, this is going to read them out in the wrong format because we're not opening, opening this in the correct mode. I think we might need to open it in binary mode or whatever it is, but we will find out. So UTF-8 codec can't decode byte yada yada into valid start but cool so what does this mean it means that we have opened this in the wrong format um which is kind of what i expected so python open file let's find the py python documentation on this python 2.7 so i presumed it has not changed no is that what we're looking for So now, this is terrible. Python open. All right, maybe it isn't here. Yeah, mode. Uh, so B is for opening it in binary mode. So RB is going to be what we want, I presume. Cool, perfect. So we're in Python 3 and we're loading in a, a file. Now it's all these weird weird characters and you can see what it is here is that it's a binary string and so it's actually loading in and printing it out as its ASCII equivalent. And so obviously a lot of these don't have defined ASCII equivalents because they're just random collection of hex, hex files, but you know. That's fine for now. So what we actually want to be doing is, instead of this, is reading it in as hex. So I wonder if there's a way to do that. One way to go find out. Read multiple bytes in a hexadecimal file. That sounds like us. Cool, so it looks like we do have the right thing. And if we store this in a variable, maybe we can look and we can see. 
So one disadvantage of this, <coughs> putting it in this file, uh, sorry, in this width construct, is anything that we declare in here, if we try and access it out, oh, you can, maybe. No, I don't. Yeah. Oh, cool. Didn't know that. I thought that would have been... All right, you can access it. Never mind me. Just the file that goes out of scope. All right, so um, print lines. So let's set a debug point here. Um, and let's run it. And let's see what lines looks like. Uh, so this might be a bit small, unfortunately. But anyway, we can see that this file is separated into 300, 300 lines. Um, and each line is just a collection of bytes. So if we want to read out the first one, we can go line zero. So this is kind of one of the reasons I use PyCharm is that the debugger is quite quite nice. You can drill down into stuff. You can put watches on things and you can, um, yeah, just really get a sense of what's going on. So this is the bytes that are on the first line. Cool. All right. What if we say, what is the zeroth byte? So we can see that the zeroth, the first byte is going to be 78. So if we come back to our hex viewer and we look at, we look at this, we can see that indeed our first byte is meant to be 78. And the next byte, this, so this is obviously in, um, in decimal, but that's fine. We can, if we have it in decimal, we can convert it to binary or to whatever. Is going to be four five. Um, should be four five. So if I do lines zero one, it should be oh, sixty nine. Ah, oh, sorry. Yeah, the um, decimal version. Cool. All right. Let's keep going then. Just as a side point, I can play some music while I'm doing this. Don't know if that's something that people want, but at this stage I'm not going to do it. But if you'd like me to put some music on, kind of while I'm speaking, then yeah, let me know in chat. Cool. Um, what's going to be next? We've got our file ready now. So kind of what we're going to be want to be doing now is to be setting up a very basic CPU structure and probably passing through the first instruction to it. So obviously we're not going to get <coughs> get many instructions done, but it would be pretty cool today to try and get one instruction implemented and to be able to read that in. As I said, the, what we're, the bytes that we're reading in at the moment are actually just data. But at some point, this will turn into program code. We can figure out where that is. That's going to depend on, on the NES and where it starts its code and where the data begins. Um, but for now, we're just going to start creating a CPU and pretend that we're going to pass in an instruction to it. So potentially, instead of reading this in through the file, we might just do this through a test harness just to make it a bit easier for us to you know, check that what we're doing is correct. Cool, all right, let's create a CPU file. So, CPU, so another thing that's in Python 3 is that all objects should inherit from this base object. Um, this is actually in Python 2 as well, but it's optional in Python 2, this is, um, you can, oh, actually, you can do it in Python 3 as well. There you go. Anyway, the convention, I believe, in Python 3 is to use this object thing, and it gives the style access to these new style classes, um, which we use in Python 3, which are pretty, pretty nice. Anyway, let's chuck in an init function. For the moment, we're probably just going to define some basic things. So what does the CPU need to do? So a CPU is um, a collection of... What does it need to store? It has registers that it needs to store. So for the moment, we can just say self.registers. And we'll just store them. 
we'll just say that's an array for now. Come back and put a proper imp implementation in later. Uh, what else does the CPU need to do? Need to store? Can't think of anything else off the top of my head, although I'm sure there's many things. It'll probably need to store references to the other things that it can talk to, but potentially it might talk to them through some kind of interface. Probably a bus um, class that we will create. So I won't do that. So what does a CPU need to do? It needs to be able to interpret and execute an instruction. As a point, I don't actually know whether there's any pipelining in this CPU. Um, it's something to probably look into, but that's a bit far down the line. That's further down the line. Cool, so let's say, let's call it a process instruction function. Now, we were talking before about things in Python 3, and one of them is type hinting. So this is kind of what I want to be, to be doing, is to mess around with this type hinting stuff, which is kind of new inline in, in Python 3.5, which I've I haven't played around with yet, so you'll have to stick with me here while I try and figure it out. But process instruction is going to take in a instruction. Um, for the moment, we're going to say that that is a... I don't actually know what that's going to be. It's probably going to be its own class, but we'll make it a string. And it's not going to return anything. Um, I believe it doesn't need to return anything. We can just leave off the type hinting. Cool, so this is the syntax, again, for how you can um, pass in type hints. So this is saying we're going to have an instruction variable parameter, which is going to be passed in, and it's going to have a type of string. And now if we try to call this without passing in a string to it, it's going to, the linter is going to complain at us. Cool, alright. Um, and... We'll just say here to do is process the instruction. Pep8. It's always good. Alright. So we are loading the ROM. Let's create our CPU. We import CPU.CPU. There's no arguments. Now, if we call CPU.process instructions, um, instruction is unfilled, and if we try and pass that an integer, it's going to throw us an, e an error because it's telling us that we expected a type string and we got an int instead. Perfect. So, what that's saying is that our type hinting is working. So, let's pass it lines. 0, and let's pass it the first 3 bytes. Now, what expected string got union int, oh, that's not how you do string splicing in Python then. I have no idea how to do that. Lines 0, I believe, is bytes. How do you splice bytes? God. Built-in types, bytes. So it's a sequence type, that makes sense. Bytes are sequences of integers between 0 and 255, so this makes sense. We we're talking before about a, this being an 8-bit CPU, and therefore it having uh, being one byte, which is between 0 and 255, so we're representing things in bytes. Nice. Alright, this means for the byte or byte array, b0 will be an integer, while b01 will be a byte array object of length 1. Alright. You can convert a bytes object into a list of integers using lisp. I don't know if we actually want to do that. So what that's telling us is that this is an integer. Line 0 should be a collection of bytes. 
line zero, zero to two, yeah, is also a collection of bytes. Cool. Now, we're not actually passing in a string, obviously. What are we, we've got union int bytes instead. So what it's telling us, so this is the type hinting, it has a some new built-in. So for instance, if you want to pass in a list, you can type list and you can import it from this new module called typing, which is new on 3.5. Um, so it looks like, if I say bytes, is this going to work? Cool, yeah, we are passing in a collection of bytes. But if I was passing in a list of integers, so if I call, cast that to list, I could call list int, I think is the syntax. But it's not, it's some bytes. All right, so an instruction is gonna be made up of multiple bytes. Again, we might replace this later by a class, but whatever. And we're just gonna print those bytes. Oops, print the instruction. Alright, let's give that a run, and that should print B N E. So we actually want to print the first three, N E S. Alright, so we now have three bytes that we are um, loading in, which are the first three bytes. Um, so typically instructions in the, let's go back and look at the MOSFET 6502. So typically instructions are going to be two or three bytes long. So you'll have one byte that will be an identifier for what the instruction is. So you can see here, high low, so that something that is eight four, the hex character eight four is going to be the store in Y operation. And then <coughs> depending on whether there's one thing here or a comma here, so this will have a single data option, so it'll be two bytes in total, whereas this will have two data options and therefore will be three bytes in total. So, yeah, so let's presume for now that we're only going to be dealing with, well, our first one will be a two byte instruction. There is a very good page on 6502, well, how do I say this? There is a fantastic wiki on NESDEV called nesdev.com. They've got a wiki, wiki.nesdev.com. Um, NES reference guide, which will basically tell you everything you need to know about, about the NES. From file formats to the CPU to anything else. So I'm probably going to be using this extensively. But at the moment, since we're just starting off, I haven't really referred to it. Uh, there is also a great website called skildrick.github.io which is github pages page in which he has some some really cool javascript things that he've written that can actually compile 6502 assembly code so this is an example of some assembly code so load into the A register the value one, store that value in memory location 0200, load into A the value five, store it in 201. Um, in this thing here, he actually represents the memory locations. If you store a value in them, it comes out as a color. So if we run this, we can see that we're loading one into this pixel, five into this pixel, which represent different colors. Um, cool. So he d he's does that using JavaScript, and you can monitor. You can see the memory here. So if you look down to zero, two hundred, whatever that is. Ah. No, you need to do more memory, but whatever. So he is he is drawing this to the screen. So it's got some really good examples of how the six five zero two assembler works and what you can do with it. Sweet. All right. So let's take his example program, which is going to be load A, put it into one, and let's think about how we could potentially interpret interpret this. So 
for now, instead of reading in the ro well, we're reading in the ROM, but instead of actually processing the ROM instructions, I just want to do a single um, be able to do a single six five zero two instruction. So if we click the hex done button here, actually even better the disassemble, disassemble button, it will tell us that the LDA zero one this gets turned into hex zero nine zero one. And what the, that actually then gets turned into is a collection of binary characters. So if I say A9 oop, A901, um, I might dump this into a new file. And I will save this in My ROMs as test dot hex cool sixty nine perfect so now when I come back to here I'll create a new configuration which is going to be called the test ROM. And in my command line argument, I'll, instead of calling that, I'll pass in test.hex. So now when we run this, well, that should be passing in our text ROM. And the first bytes that we're going to get are going to be A9, which is... Oh, interesting. is physically the bytes A9. That's a bit confusing. Well, let's take a look at what lines is. Right, so it's not reading it in. Yeah, it's not actually saved in hex. It's just pretending to be saved in hex. I suppose that then becomes a great question of how do we save something in hex? I don't know. Well, let's do it a cheat way. Let's copy this Super Mario Brothers NES. Let's call it test.ness. Let's open it up here. Never mind that. That's a bad idea. Let's figure out where the NES starts programming. And let's actually take some real instructions then. Alright. CPU. File format. NES. So the CPU... Yeah, so the CPU's got to run at a fixed frequency as well. <clears throat> so we're going to have to do that, and it's going to have to be reading in one instruction at a time, and the reality of the CPU is that each cycle has to do a read or a write. Yeah, the APU is also contained in the same chip, which is the audio processing unit. So we're going to do audio. Yeah, so... There are, because it's an 8-bit processor, so <laughs> similar to everything else, there are going to be 256 possible instructions that we can run. The reality is going to be that not all of them are real instructions. I think only around 150 of them are. Um, oh well, let's see what we can do. Alright. NES is the de facto standard. An INS consists of the following sections. The header, correct. We can see that. That has the 
So the first 16 characters to round zero. Yeah, so these ones are the header. So what it's telling us is you've got the letters Ness and then some, I don't know, press and check digits or something and then just blank data. A trainer, no idea. PRG ROM data, sounds promising. CHR ROM data, I don't know what these acronyms mean, but I guess we can find out. So as I said, so I've while I've done CPU stuff before, and I've done some assembly stuff before, I've worked with MIPS before a bit, but I've never done emulator stuff or NES stuff. So well, a lot of these things are going to be going to be new to me. As new as they are to you, I presume. All right, format of the header. Yeah, okay. So NES followed by an end of the file, the size of the PRG ROM. Cool. So, N E S, and then this is our check digit. So, O2 is going to tell us the size of the PRG ROM in 16 kilobyte units. So, we have a 32 kilobyte PRG ROM. And then the next value is O1. So, we're going to have a 8 kilobyte CHR ROM. Flags. So what are these flags? Okay. So whether it has RAM or horizontal mirroring or whatever, we probably don't need to worry about that for now. Size of the PRG RAM. Um, byte 8. Zero. So we want the number 7. Yeah, so this is the size of the RAM is 0. Value 0 infers 8 kilobyte for compatibility. Okay, so we have 32 PRG ROM, 8 kilobyte PRG RAM, and 8 kilobyte CHR ROM. Bytes, whatever, don't really care about them. So what is PRG versus CHR? G, presumably program, but PRG RAM seven. Yeah, this one replies blah blah blah. Here's the discrete boards. Yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, here we go. That's easy. So the Nest cartridge has at least two memory chips on it: PRG connected to the CPU and CHR. Right. So CHR is going to be where we store our sprite data presumably and PRG is going to be where we store our program I wonder what CHR stands for alright there is always at least one PRG ROM and there may be an additional PRG RAM so PRG is going to be something that's connected to the, t to the CPU so we're going to read data from the PRG ROM presumably our program code and we're going to write data such as save file to the PRG RAM <coughs> Some cartridges have CHR ROM, which hold a set of graphics tile data. Cool. Um, all right. Cool. So presumably our PRG RAM ROM, sorry, is going to start. We have thirty-two kilobytes of it times x bytes, where x is 2 in this case, so we're going to have 32 kilobytes starting trainer if present. Hmm. 
wonder if the trainer is present. Cool, so a trainer at this stored before the data is a flag six, flags six. Right, so we're going to need to convert flag six to binary and see what is flag zero, one, two, uh, is this flag six? There's the header. That's the PRG ROM, PRG uh, CHR ROM. Flag six is this, is zero one. Cool. So zero one in binary means that every bit except bit number one is going to be off. So this flag six thing, no, oh, that's going to be two in binary. It's going to be this bit is not going to be off. The zero bit is going to be on. So we're saying that vertical arrangement, horizontal mirroring. Cool. Pro don't care about that. We can flip that later. But what we're saying is five to bit 12 trainer is only on if the second bit of that flag six is on. That's going to be false. So the PRG data should hypothetically start after the header, after 16 bytes. And it should run for 16, uh, for 32 kilobytes. Okay, so it should start at zero, if we look down here, the address, it should start at zero, one, two. So this should be our program code from here on. Alright, I can deal with that. Let's copy out some bytes here. Let's go to back to our back to our page here and let's try and figure out what these codes actually mean. So what was it? Seven eight D eight A nine. So what is a seven eight instruction? So row seven, so this one. Number eight. SEI. Suppose that's feasible. So these instructions are gonna have no data bits. So actually this seven eight is gonna be a single instruction. And then this D8, A9 is going to be another instruction, presumably. So what's D8? Uh, D, which one's D? D8, all right, and that one. What's A9? All right. Does this seem feasible? A9, load A. All right, that looks quite promising. So we've got two things that, I don't know what SEI and whatever the other one do, but something, and then we're going to load a value into register A. So this looks like it may well be our program code. Um, and then presumably the next couple of bits will tell us, 1,0 AD will tell us which bits we want to load into A. Cool, 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 cool. So let's go to jump. So we are going to say that let's just pass in the first line. Actually, how long is lines? Lines zero. Go back to main. Line zero. Get the length of lines zero. 
45. All right, so if we strip away the first, we'll say instructions equals lines zero. We'll just look at the first line for now. And we know that there's a 16 bit header. So we'll just say, take it from 16 on. Um, let's look at instructions. might be complicated. Three. Five. Oh yeah, that should be right. So 15 should be zero, and then 16 should be something. Yep, so if we take it from 16, and we go all the way to the end, Yeah, I'm not sure if that's correctly indexing our, our bytes. It's a great question, isn't it? What if we do file.read? See what lines comes up as. So lines is bytes. Right, so this is going to read the entire thing. I probably want that instead of red lines. Um, but we still want this, but without the, without that. Cool. So now the zeroth byte is 120. Okay. So. Instructions start from 16 and go on until 32 kilobytes. They last for 32 kilobytes, which is from 16 to 16 plus 32 or like kilobyte calculations. 32, 168 or roughly, something like that. Sixteen three eight four times that many bytes. So we we'll want to come back and not hard code this. Um, Unhard code. Number of PRG blocks is going to be two in this ROM, but we'll just make it. We'll make it that, do that for now. So now we're going to load in all our instruction all our instructions. Um, so this instructions thing should be 32768, which sounds around right to me. Should be this times two. Correct, so we have 32 kilobytes. Each one of those entries represents a single byte of data. Um, we can probably put all these constants and pull them into their own configuration thing that can read the header, so header reader or something. Um, there's also going to be a fair amount of stuff that needs to be done with, um, sorry, there's going to be a fair amount of stuff that needs to be done with configuration and boot up status and stuff like that to set the initial state of the CPU. Um, again, we can come back and do that later. All right, cool. So we've got our instructions. We can now read them in one at a time. So let's do a for loop. So for instruction in instructions, we're going to pass in that instruction. Instructions. So that's the problem. Is instructions not iterable? I turn that into a list of instructions, will that not complain? Yep. Um, ideally, you probably wouldn't want to turn it into a list, actually.
I don't know about that. I'll leave that as that for now. Doesn't really matter because I believe that instruction is going to come out as an int anyway. All right. Process instruction. Print instruction. Let's just break after one loop of this and check that we are indeed. Yeah, so we're getting our first byte, which is 120. Now, the bytes. Yeah, expected and iterable. Bytes are weird. I don't know. Cool. We're actually passing in an int, technically, but let's just create a class where we can store instructions. So another thing that I'm going to be trying to use here is is mixins. So instructions are going to be a collection of two things. One, they're going to have a purpose, so they're going to load into a register or they're going to do something else. And two, they're going to have an addressing mode. So one of the features of 6502 is that it has a lot of different ad modes to address things in. So you can say, grab me this, you know, to put in register A, I want to put the number 7, or alternatively I want to put in whatever's in memory location, this memory location, or alternatively I want to put in whatever's in uh, memory location that is 200 ahead of me or 200 behind me, or that is a memory location that's stored in another memory location, and you know, stuff like that. So there's all these different ways, but you're going to be consistent, I think, between all the instructions. So basically we're going to have some kind of mix-ins that allow it to be addressable, or in some instructions are not addressable, but also addressable in different ways and stuff like that. Um, for now, we'll just have a class though. Um, instruction. This should probably be called instruction as well. Cool. And we'll make it a new style object. We'll chuck in an init. So what is, what is this going to store? So this is actually going to take in a byte. And I mean, it actually gets passed in as an int. I kind of want to store it as... Hmm. I need to figure out how we can cast things to binary. Um, it's going to be important to figure out. <coughs> as well as casting them to hex but for the moment, I'll pass it around as an int. So, it's actually going to have a code that it starts off with, which is going to be a single byte, which is going to be an int. I'm going to call this an identifier byte. So this is going to be what this table This is going to be what this table is showing you. So the identifier byte is going to be, it's going to tell you that, it, you know, if it's 6.5, it's going to tell you that it's an ADAC operation. So that's why we need that. There's actually going to be a dynamic amount of data that it needs to pull in based on the length. It's going to be interesting. So basically, unlike a MIPS or a similar instruction language, there's actually not a fixed instruction length. So, for instance, in MIPS, all instructions, or, you know, in the one that I was using, all instructions are going to be 32 bits long. So, a program might look like this, right? Um, whatever. They might be different, but they'll all be the same length. In 6502, what we're going to have is that depending on the type of indexing that you're using, there's going to be a different amount of data that you need to pull for each instruction. So, some instructions might take up three, three bytes, so it might be, you know, FF, 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 other ones might be take up two bytes, and other ones are just going to take up one byte. Um, so this identifier byte is going to be the first byte in all of these, but then we're going to need to pull more or less data depending on what the type of instruction is, and I think that's going to come back to our how our mix-ins are going to work. Um, this is why I kind of want to do it through mixins instead of through inheritance, was because it would be cool to have different classes just be able to pick which type of indexing they want, but not have it be a distinguishing feature. 
also not have it being inherited, well, you know, directly inherited. And then that mix in can figure out how much data it needs to pull and how to do that. But for now, we'll just say it's got an identifier by it and we'll store it. Great. All right. So we've now got. Well, let's just do that. So we're really taking a byte and then we're going to say instruction equals import that. Um, we're assuring us itself that it's an int, which it is, which is good. Look, I'm going to turn this into a list for now so it stops complaining. I'll try and figure out later how to do that properly. List might be bad because, well, I mean, I suppose it's already in a list, but there's no point casting something to a list given it's already an iterable. Well, it doesn't think it's iterable, but it is. Well, I'll figure out how to do that later. Uh, cool. So we want to. So I'm just going to pull this out. So instruction is now over here to split the window. Um, Cool, so what does the instruction tell us to do? Um, we want it to have a property, uh, sorry, a method that's going to process. Now, presumably, we're going to make instruction a base class, and we're going to have different instructions implement different versions of the class, which implement different process methods. Um, so, you know, for instance, for a load A instruction, it would come down and, you know, so, you know, self dot CPU, presumably have a link to the CPU somehow, you know, dot A registers dot A is, you know, equal to seven, right? So that's what the LDA thing might do, where it's a different one, we'll do something completely different. What's the... <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that is a great question, KDX. So, I should write that out more explicitly. So, what I've kind of been looking at is this nest file format. So, what it is, is basically a header of 16 bytes, and then your trainer, which is not present in this case, but and then all your program data. So, what that is, is trying to figure out where our program data begins. So we have a 16-byte header, and then we know that our program data is going to be 16, this is 16 kilobytes, times x. Um, and this x is going to give, be given to us in the header. So I'm going to write this out with some constants, because you're right, that doesn't actually make any sense. So the header size, really these should be constants. Um, so there's going to be a, a header that is the start of every ROM, and then there is going to be... So basically we want to start, look at all the lines in the ROM, oh, all the bytes in the ROM, sorry. Again, this should probably just say bytes. Bytes is a reserve word though. Um, ROM bytes. Cool. So we want to take a look at the ROM bytes, and then we want to start at the header, and we want to go from the header until we hit 16 kilobytes times the number of programming bobs. So uh, KB16. It's a terrible variable name, but you get the point. So basically, that's not bad, eh? Hey? I might put some some brackets in here as well to make this more clear. So what we're doing is we start at the header size, which if we look at the ROM, is going to be these bits. So these are not part of our code, and everything from here on is the next 32 kilobytes. So we're going to start at 16 
and then we're going to go from 16 to 16 kilobytes times how many programming blocks there are. And the number of programming blocks is actually what whatever this value is set to. So there's two 16 kilobyte blocks and that's to find the header specification. Hopefully that clears it up a bit. Presumably I'll come back and change this. KB. <laughs> that's, that's a great point. I will do that. Um, uh, 16 times KB. So, um, program data and last for a set number of 16 kilobyte blocks. Variable and function. Um, yeah, okay. So we have 16 kilobyte blocks. Um, we will pull this number out later. Unhard code, pull from ROM header. Thank you. What? Kdex. Thanks for that. That was, that was good. Alright, so let's go through and let's just say that this doesn't do anything and we're going to make this a instruction should be a um, the term I'm looking for is abstract abstract class so now I don't actually know if Python 3 does abstract classes any differently let's find out Uh, ABC doesn't look like it has changed. So this is kind of one of the weird things about Python is that to do abstract classes you've got to inherit, or not inherit, you've got to implement this ABC thing, which I can never remember how to do. In Python 3.4 and above you can inherit from ABC. Ah, there you go. So that was the old weird thing in the old Python. You need to specify your meta class as ABC meta, which was a bit weird. So this is how you did it in Python 2. Um, in Python 3.4, we can just inherit from ABC, which is super cool. Love your code. It's pretty clear. Thank you. Como and Como and Como Como andis. Let me know if that's right. Yeah, um, I'm using the Darkly theme on um, PyCharm, um, which is which is super super pretty. And yeah, we'll try and make it as as nice as possible. So this is actually instead of inheriting from object, this is going to inherit from ABC. And we're going to import ABC.abc. Um, this code might get a bit messier as we go on, but uh, it should stay pretty nice because I think that the Nest Emulator is not going to be too crazy. That being said, I've never done, never done an emulator before for it, so we'll we'll find out. So abstract method. So I'm going to presume that people know how inheritance works and how abstract classes work, um, but the way that you do it in Python is with these decorators. So function decorators they use these at simple and they're going to stick around above any function you want to annotate and basically tell you something about it. So we're telling whoever inherits from instruction that it's actually got to have, uh, it's got to implement this process function. Um, and you can just call pass in here because you know that, well we could do something in here and then if, if the base class calls super this code will get run, but you know, for now we're just going to not do that. Actually, we should. I'm going to make it print. So, a cool way is... <laughs> yeah, someone looking over my shoulder. Alright, a cool way of doing this, this is in Python 2 as well, I presume, but the format code in Python 3 
is basically it allows you to pass in a string and I believe that's the syntax um, is pass in you know our identifier byte God. so we want to pass in an identifier byte and we want to fill up this value and format it with the value that's in our, our variable so now if we call super.process it will print out the, um, the thing now I'll separate this later but let's begin with a load a because that was a command that we saw instruction which is going to inherit from instruction now init I might need to override and do different things with depending on the instruction but for now I'm just going to override process um, so another cool thing Python 3 is that super now doesn't need to be passed in the in Python 2 you was uh, forget the exact syntax but something like you had to pass in the class name and then call anyway super just works now so you can call super dot process um, and that will call the the parents function which is a lot cleaner so we're not going to do anything else for now on that um, and we'll say we'll pretend for now that this is going to be an LDA everything is going to be an LDA instruction cool um, this is this is cool so now when we process an instruction we are actually going to receive an instruction here now we're going to have to import that and when we pass instruction in so that type error now went away because we're thanks to linting um, we're actually going to um, I actually just thought about something to do back here but we're actually going to instead of saying print instruction we're going to call instruction dot process cool um, now the CPU can also do other stuff here potentially this is where we're going to figure out which data needs to be passed into the function and then we can you know work from there all right um, let's see if that works it can be static yet but fair enough we'll make it non-static later um, another cool thing about PyCharm is you can really easily reformat and make thing, sure things are pep eight, but you can also optimize your import so anything you're not using anymore just gets chucked out <laughs> which is super handy when you're you know forget that you're leaving using different classes and just make your code code cleaner which is what we want right cool so this is not actually how we're going to iterate through this list but let's just check that this works for now cool so we are taking the first instruction we're passing it to the CPU we are pretending it's an LDA instruction um, and we're yeah calling the process method which calls super.process which is saying the identifier byte is 120 sweet all right so what do we actually want to do now if we think about this the um, the CPU is probably the one that should be running this code and instead of iterating through the bytes really it wants to be reading one instruction at a time so the way it's probably going to be doing that is by simulating what's called the program counter so if I go back to go back to here so if we imagine that every line of code LDA um, you know store the number seven and then store the number eight for some reason if you want to override it store the number nine now if these are all stored this is stored at memory location zero this is stored at one this is stored at two basically what we'll have is we'll have a value over here that's called the program counter which is stored by the CPU and this is going to be set start at zero so what this PC tells us program counter is that hey CPU to find the next instruction you want to execute execute go to line zero and then once this instruction runs actually since this is going to be two bits of data wide this will be at two and this will be at four if that makes sense so this is position zero this is position one so it will say go to position zero and execute whatever's there so it'll find an LDA 
And so it'll execute that. And the LDA will come back and tell the CPU, look, I have moved execution forward by two bytes. So the PC counter gets updated and then gets set to two. And so this is the way that we're going to keep track of what's going on. And so the next time it gets to an instruction, it'll come down and execute here. So the instructions should tell us how far to move the PC counter. Um, and then that way we can know how much data was taken, you know, how much data this instruction needed and where it needs to continue execution and yada yada. All right, cool. Um, another thing here, I'm probably going to be using a lot of classes. Um, it's probably, you know, that you can definitely do it in a more functional way, but I actually really like classes, especially in Python. With stuff like mix-ins, uh, it seems like it's going to be quite well suited to what we're doing here. All right. Um, cool. So let's get rid of this. Create the CPU. This stuff can all go up here, actually. So we get the instructions. Now, we're going to tell the CPU to process instructions. I'm going to tell it to load... So, so the CPU is going to have to maintain some memory. If every instruction is a variable length, how does the PC know how to index the PRG properly? Great question. So the instructions are of variable length, but they are of defined length. So, so an LDA instruction is of a different length to a you know, PRQ instruction or whatever. But intrinsically, so if I look at, um, uh, God, yeah, if I look at this, you can see that a, a BRK instruction is only going to be one byte long, whereas a LDA instruction is going to be two bytes long. So this LDA is actually separate to this LDA, which is three bytes long. So basically, just by knowing, by reading the instruction bit, which says A9, we're going to know not only what type of instruction it is, but how many bytes the program counter needs to be moved forward to get to the next instruction. So they are a variable length, but we know what those variable lengths are depending on the instruction. So it's just something that we're going to need to implement and then keep track of through the PC counter, uh, which is a register, I think, in terms of implementation. Uh, let me know if that needs more explanation. Um, it, it should become more, more clear in, in time as well. So I think we're going to load all these instructions. So basically, I think what happens is that they will actually get copied from the ROM into the memory of the computer. Um, but I'm not 100% sure about that. It may well just read off the ROM. So I don't know. Let's um, just pass in instructions. So let's say process instructions, and we'll pass in some instructions. Now what's an instruction? It's going to be a list of integers. List of integers. Cool. We can get rid of all this stuff now. Um, cool. So let's go to our CPU, and let's go to def process instruction. It might even be a better way of doing this would be to create a ROM class and the ROM class has a set of accesses where you can access a yeah awesome sweet um, where you can access a set amount of bytes so the CPU is actually going to communicate so instead of just passing a list of instructions let's um, let's create a ROM class and the ROM will be responsible for doing all this crap. Hang that over here. And then we can get more of this stuff out of my main code. Basically, I just want the main to be set up, parsing the args, um, loading, and then all this ROM stuff can actually be pushed to, to here. So we can get it away and we can abstract everything away, which is, which is nice. So what's a ROM got? So I'm going to say that it has a data 
test data, which is actually just a list of bytes. And by list of bytes, we're going to pass that in as a list of ints, because that's how we're going to store that. Again, so this is this Python um, typing system, um, type hinting. So list is going to come from typing, which is a new module in Python 3.5, which just makes it easier to do what we're doing here. Makes it easier to annotate what you're um, what you're doing. Cool. All right. So a ROM is going to have number of PRG blocks. So this is again going to be set from the config, so we can do that all in here, but for now we'll just do it for, set it to 2. Um, then we'll set this. This, this can all move. It's going to be really nice when it all works out. Um, and we're pulling this out of data, which is actually, oh yeah, we'll call ROM bytes. Um, header, header size, number, self dot number of programming blocks. Cool. Um, that looks that looks better. And self dot instructions. And they're not really instructions. It's really a collection of bytes. So I'm going to say self dot bytes. So bytes is a reserved word. Um, but self.bytes is not. That being said, it's probably bad practice, so I'm going to not call it that. I'm just going to call it self.data for now. Or data bytes or something. Who knows? Alright, so let's just give that a bit of a format. Um, where's my code? Just make sure that's pep80. Cool, so we now no longer do that. We no longer need these. We set up our command line arguments, we load the ROM. This all gets done by loading. So ROM equals ROM. Mm. ROM bytes. Another thing that Python 3 is going to do for us is that it gives us some keyword only arguments, which are pretty cool. So I might start using them as well. So. Previously, if you had function parameter A, parameter B, and then like, you know, reverse, false, false. So this would be a flag where you could pass in, should, you know, the data that comes out of this be reversed. And so obviously the, the danger is if you call this function A, B, and then you accidentally pass in like a third parameter or something, this three can be set reverse, and then if you're calling if reverse, you know, do something, then this three will be taken as true, and that's going to be bad. So what you can do in Python three is you can do this, and it basically means that if you pass in this three here, it's not going to assign it to this name parameter. It's going to give you a give you an error, and the only way to access that reverse function is to explicitly say reverse equals true. Anyway. We'll come back to that um, at a later point when we're writing things that need it. Uh, list of... cool. So a CPU is now going to have reference. So I'm not going to make the CPU have reference to a ROM. I'm not going to pass it in the constructor. I'm going to make it load a ROM um, because potentially we might need it to copy it into memory later. I'm not actually sure how it works. So we want to be able to change the implementation of how this works. We'll pass in a ROM. So def load. God. Memory wise, you really want to instantiate a new object for every instruction. A giant switch case might be a lot more performant. Um so <laughs> good question. Yes. The the answer is almost certainly this is going to be terrible performance wise. Um, my thought is, I, I'm kind of starting this off with the, I want to make this as nice as possible in terms of the code, uh, what the code looks like, and not worry about performance at all. I'm kind of hoping that because it's a NES, probably it's not going to be too, too intense and we probably should be able to run it even if we're doing stupid stuff like this. 
Uh, if it turns out that it is super slow, then I'll probably change it. But I'm definitely going to prioritize, for now at least, things that are look nicer and make more sense to me rather than things that are going to be performant. But I completely agree because a, a switch L, switch else will definitely be way better and having things be functions instead of classes and all this kind of stuff is, is definitely going to be a lot a lot quicker. But yeah, for now at least, I, I would really, my, my kind of, the reason that I want to do classes for instructions is because I want to be able to do mix-ins for the different addressing modes. Now, Again, I'm not super certain on how all these things work, like I said, I just started looking into it, but it would be pretty cool if we could get a lot of this functionality for free and have this line. My thought is, if this works properly, it might be 50 lines of code as opposed to, you know, a couple of hundred. Anyway, we will see. I think the, um, the answer to that question is, um, I will definitely fix it later if, if it needs to be fixed. Screw that. Let's go with cool code over fast code. That's the that's the way. All right. Instructions. What am I doing? Loading a ROM. So loading a ROM is going to take in a ROM, which is going to be of type ROM. Just so we get our function annotations going. Um, for now, we're going instead of loading it into memory, we'll just store a reference to it. Um, yeah, this is a, a, a bad way of doing it because then we'll have to check if the ROM is none and, and stuff like that but uh, I'm, I'm kind of assuming that there's going to be a lot of changes here later so I'm not going to worry too much about it process instruction um, cool so now load ROM So I'm actually going to rename this, this might make more sense, to run ROM. Um, what this will do is load it into memory and then start running it, running it, and then this way we know that a ROM has been set. So instead of process instructions, now we can call, well, let's create a program counter. We know that execution starts at 16. Um, 16 bytes into the code. So we'll set our program counter. Uh, this will also, when you're doing jumps and stuff like that, this PC is what going to be what we're going to need to change. Alright, self.rom is num. Yada. Cool. So let's run an instruction. So the ROM at the moment just stores the data, but really what I want it to be able to do is return. I don't. Uh, so potentially this might get loaded into memory later, but at the moment I'm going to be querying the ROM and trying to figure out what the ROM wants to do. Okay. So self dot call data or something. Get bytes. And position, which is going to be an int. So we're going to get the data, the bit. And it's going to return an int, even though we're talking about bytes. Potentially later I might make it actually everything work in bytes, but I think at the moment we're just going to make it all work in ints. Um, oh, God, I don't need to do that anymore. Sweet. All right. That's pretty cool. Uh, it gets the byte at a given position. Cool. So return self.databytes position. All right, run ROM. So we now want to run through, so let's say here we're gonna load the ROM, potentially we might need to copy it to memory or something. 
run the program. All right, so running the program is going to start iterating through this um, piece of code by starting with this program counter. So while true, uh, this will probably be, need to be like while the flag is not set or something. I'll say it's running for now. There's, yeah, it's probably going to be a flag, so. Let's just say that running is true. While we're running, we want to read the instruction that is at the program counter. So, instruction. self.rom.getByte at 16, no, at our program counter. So, and then we want to turn the program, the byte into an instruction. So we now have a byte, a single byte. Um, what do we know about this byte? We know it's going to identify what the instruction is going to be. So we need some way of turning that instruction into the correct the correct class. So what KDEX was saying was potentially just having a giant switch L switch case, um, which is probably the best way to do it. What I kind of want to do is do something a bit dodgy. Not dodgy, uh, something a bit more fun. So we're going to create something that is going to map instructions into, uh, sorry, bytes, so identifier bytes, into instructions. So for instance, we know, and I'm going to create it here for now, but probably it's going to go somewhere else. So self.instruction mapping. Um, I'm going to make this a dictionary. Um, what we know is there's a set of instructions. So where was load A? Here we go. So A9 is going to be a load A, and we're going to load in a, a number. So A9 in hexadecimal is... There it is there. So sorry, let me just pull up. Hex, show hex is back there. A9 is 169. So if we know, if we see the value 169, we actually want to load an LDA instruction. Um, now, because everything is first class objects in Python, so functions and classes and stuff like that, we can just pass around a reference like this, and then later on we can just create a new one by um, calling new. I mean, you don't actually call new, but putting brackets next to it will make a new object. So we're just passing around a reference to the class at the moment, not a an actual object. So this is not instantiated. Uh, all right, cool. So now we want to turn the byte into an instruction. So instruction equals self dot instruction mapping identifier byte um, now identifier byte is going to be an int and this thing is indexed by ints so this should work out now the the thing to do here is going to be to use get and to have it return none so the <coughs> if we just use a square bracket syntax here then if we get an identifier byte that we don't recognize, then the program's going to crash. Um, what we want is to get it and to set a default. So if it can't find it, instead it's going to return none. So let's say if instruction, so is not none. Let's explicitly check for it. So Python is a bit weird sometimes in that if instruction will work for things like true or false, and whether it's none or not, um, it can be a bit weird. It can have some unintended effects. So, for instance, if you think you're comparing a 
you know, you think you're comparing an integer, oh, sorry, you think you're comparing a Boolean, you're actually comparing an integer or something. So a lot of the time you want to be doing explicitly checking for nuns, like we are here. We can do if instruction is not none, then we want to do something. So here we're actually going to say if instruction is none, we kind of want to throw an error. How do you throw errors in Python? Raise. So we want to raise an exception. And we want to say that exception is instruction not found. Self.pc should be set to header size. That is a fantastic point. Header size is stored in ROM. Yeah, there we go. Self.rom, uh, self.pc equals. Hmm. I'm actually going to make this, because we might have ROMs that have different header sizes. I'm actually going to unhard, well, going to unconstant that. And then that way, we can say the PC is actually set to the header size of the specific ROM that we're starting in. Um, this is kind of another Python quirk, obviously. If you want variables to be recognized by the class, you have to declare them in the init function. Typically, I set these to none, so instead of setting them to zero, because I want to know if I'm here, or you know, if I'm somewhere else, has this ever been set, or is that a default value? So if you set it to none, that's kind of clear to say that, hey, it's never been set. Uh, yeah, this code is already starting to be cleaner, except this needs to be. I might put this on a new line, just to make it a bit... Oh, that doesn't look nice. Reformat code. All right, um, thank you, KDX, that's yeah, a good point. Cool, all right, so if, if we don't find the instruction, then we want to raise an exception. Um, potentially we can refactor this out into its own method, just for the sake of, of less indented code, less, but now, so, all right, we're going to start at instruction 16, and now instruction 16 should be this one, which is going to be 78, hex 78, which is where, you know, a stex or something, we looked it up before. Now, we haven't implemented that, so presumably this should raise an exception saying instruction not found. Awesome. Now, here's the fun part. Let's make it work. And to do that, Let's implement a 7-8 uh, instruction. It's an SEI instruction. So again, I'll separate these out later, but let's just get three instructions going. Obviously, these classes will actually do different things later on. And the last one's going to be D8. Um, D8. CLD. Now, I don't actually know what these instructions do, so I'm not going to properly in implement them. Um, but my hope is that it will, um, yeah, we'll implement them properly <laughs> in due course. And obviously I have some documentation about what these actually do. Cool. All right. So we need to put them into our instruction mapping. So let's check that here. So 7.8 is 120. And 120 was SEI. And D8 is going to be 216, which is going to map to our CLD instruction. Now, again, there's, there might be better ways of doing this. Oh, might be. There are better ways of doing this. But for now, I'm just going to have this, this dictionary um, and then just 
reference that whenever it, um, yeah, update it for now. Uh, I'll come up with a smarter way of doing this later. Cool, so now we should actually get three instructions in before we hit an instruction that we haven't encountered before. Or four instructions in. Instruction not found. Alright, that's interesting. So, let's see if we're, if we're making it. Ah, yeah. So, instruction is none. Identifier byte is two. Get this, you get 16. Right, so the answer is I have already offset by 16 here. Um, so the program counter should actually just be set to, to zero. Now the interesting thing is, I don't think it should be. I think we should be dealing with everything in absolute terms, in, in memory terms, probably. It's going to make our lives a lot easier. So we do want our PC to start at 16. What we don't want, when we pass in this, we actually want it to get the data. Yeah, so actually, this is our PRG bytes. But the ROM bytes actually start at zero. So, oh god, that's annoying. So what's another way of saying this? So we don't actually want to index things. When we get a byte, we actually want to give it this position should be relative to ROM bytes, not to the PRG bytes. We don't probably really care about what these PRG bytes are. We just care about the whole thing. Does Python 3 have hex literals? Yeah, that's a great point. I have no idea. Let's look it up. At the moment, I am doing everything in ints. It might be cleaner for debugging to use instead of looking at <laughs> Yes, that is 100% true. Uh, my suspicion is that there's uh, the byte representation is probably going to be the closest that you come, but I don't actually know. Yeah, use byte literal. And you can say bytes dot from hex. That's going to be really useful. So probably the answer is what to do is don't store everything as int, store it as bytes. And when I want to refer to a hex thing, I can just type bytes dot from hex. Yeah, you're right, that's gonna be way cleaner. Yeah. I just wanna check that there's no other things here. All right, let's do that now. So we're reading it. Instead of passing it in as a list, so this list is going to turn it into ints. We're just going to pass in the ROM bytes. The ROM bytes, instead of getting a list of ints, now gets in a collection of bytes. Um, ROM bytes, this sh all this logic should still work, I believe. We don't need list anymore. And we want to return this, except this is now going to return a byte. Interesting. Is a single byte a byte? I don't know. Let's find out. Presumably this is going to complain if I, if I do this wrong. So, um, instead of this, I should do bytes dot from hex, sick. So let's look up the SEI instructions. Here we are. So SEI was, ah, I can just look at my, my ROM here. So 7, 8 is the hex for the first one. And then the next one is D8. Let me just check that D8 is CLB. Right, so do I just do that? Probably should have. 
we should have done that check that before from hex yeah okay so I just passed it a string and LDA was a9 I believe nice cool cool um yeah let's see if that works Identify byte is an int, which is probably not what we want. So let's go here. Let's see what these bytes actually are. Self.rom bytes is a collection of bytes. So I think you can't reference an individual byte. Is that right? Self dot rom bytes zero equals int seventy eight. Hmm. So what does byte stop from hex return? Yeah, it returns the segment of bytes. Oh, cool. What did self dot rom bytes? How do I get a segment of bytes zero to two? I did zero one. Yeah. All right. So instead of doing this, I can do instead of directly indexing it, which returns an int, I can just do position and then position plus one, and that will return me a single byte. Ah, it will return me a single byte, but in the form of eight bytes, um, which should. So now when I come down here, my identifier byte is a single, single byte. Hmm. Yeah, which is maps to X, <coughs> which yeah is from hex means seven eight. Is there a two hex? So now if I do identify by it, can I can I print that as two hex or hex? Yeah, nice. All right, so now we have we can get the hex representation of a byte instead of passing around decimals. That is going to be way cleaner. Um. Cool, and now our instruction, we can see, is indeed a SEI instruction, which is 78 is what we want. So we now have our first instruction being written. It doesn't do anything yet, but that's fine. Um, when we get down to LDA instruction, so let's keep going here. So we have a valid instruction, presumably, because we haven't raised that exception out. Valid might be an interesting word. Non-exception raising instruction. Um, let's see. Hmm. What do we want to do now? We want to execute it. I don't know what I called the instruction function. Process. I'm going to rename that to execute because I prefer that. Nice. So now, presumably, if we run this code, it's going to print out the first three instructions. Ooh, execute missing a positional argument. Fair enough. Doing something dodgy there. Ah, interesting. Am 
must be using abstract base classes wrong. Derived abstract, derived data foo hooray. Huh. Hmm. I see our instruction is a class. Well, let's do SCI instruction dot execute. Passing it's the ah ah jeez okay I'm not very smart so instruction is actually this is going to give us our class that's what I've done wrong so if instruction class is known then so we want to actually make an instruction. instruction class. Instruction class is not callable. Sure, so how do we... Hmm. Python instantiate class when that class is an object. Class view is equals to one. Oh, so maybe I can't do this. Ah, because I'm not passing in an identifier by which the identifier instruction now no longer needs. Ah, so I could construct this automatically by making them a property of here. But we'll do that some other time. Look, I'll pass it in. Nice. Um, now we, so we ha now have an instruction that is being executed um, over and over and again. The PC is not getting incremented because um, we don't define, we don't ever increment it, so it never change moves instructions. So let's create a thing called instruction length. Now actually I can make this an abstract property. Property. And I'll say it returns one. But instruction length. Whereas these ones have an instruction length of one. So I'm probably going to make this explicit rather than implicit. Can you make this, please? <laughs> um, I could. <laughs> hmm. 
Alright, so we now have a instruction link. So after we've executed that instruction, let's say self.pc plus equals the instructions instruction link. So now, sweet. So we now are reading in the first three, um, first three things. Let's give these all a name as well. Whoa. In fact, instead of giving them a name, we can just override their string methods, because that's probably a Python-y thing to do, right? Load A. And instead of execute printing, let's just make it print self dot string and then let's make this so what we're doing here is we're making the execute method just print the string of the class we're overriding the string method in each class and then we will just make it return LDA and the identifier byte so we are making the string of each instruction tell us a bit about itself. This is a bit more verbose, but it's going to tell us good information in the, in the long run. Sweet. So it tells us the first instruction is an SEI, which and the identifier byte was that. Now this this isn't particularly useful to us because we can't read this. So let's turn this into two hex. Now obviously we're going to be able to standardize this late, late, later. Um, in fact, we can do it now because we're going to make this code code sexy. Cool, so identifier byte was 7.8, which makes an SEI, CLD, um, which was a D8, and then LDA, which was an A9. Um, cool, so let's make this nice and generic, and say we're going to put the instruction name here, and then the instruction byte, and we'll say it's our self dot name. So what we're doing here is we're overriding string in the base class. We're going to change this. <coughs> this is going to be our name. And our identifier byte is going to be this variable. And so we just have to make another abstract property called our name. Undefined. And now we can just say our name is LDA. Now it's a little bit cleaner. And looks a little bit nicer, I think. So this um, single So typically in Python, uh, well in other languages as well, I, I tend to use a single quotation mark around strings with the exception of when I'm doing string formatting, I use double quotation marks. Um, that's the way it's done in Ruby. It's just a bit of a convention that, um, that I just follow across that. Cool. All right. Instruction class is not callable. because it's an ABC, and so it's inheriting. Uh, this is something we can figure out later. It works. <laughs> All right, um, cool. So we have three instructions now. They are, we read in the file. We know it's SEI, CLD, LDA, and we know what identifier bytes they are, and we each of these can have a different execution path. You really 
you get hate letters. Yeah, I've been doing some Java recently, and it has tripped me up multiple times. Because um, single quotation marks in Java look and pretend to be strings, but they're definitely not. So yeah, I've, I've been hit by that one before. I don't actually know what they are, they're like byte literals or something in Java. With a single quotation mark. It's a bit weird. Oh well. Um, in, in your Rubies and your Pythons as well, there's no real difference. Actually in Ruby you need to have double quotation marks to um to format strings, but Alright. Um cool. So now we're executing through the program. They're chars. <laughs> that makes sense. Does Python have chars? Isn't uh, that was yeah, I'm a bit confused by that, but I think that Python two strings were a collection of chars, but in Python three they're actually strings? Maybe? I don't know. It's something I should probably look into. Oh well. Alright. Cool. So what's next? Making these instructions actually do something? And um, yeah. Pr implementing more instructions. There's definitely going to be a smarter way to doing this. Instead of having, I might just do that now, instead of having this instruction mapping be constructed like this, um, probably the easiest way is going to do it is and this way we don't have to pass in the identifier byte we can again do let's put an abstract property on here which is an our identifier byte return um, hmm, great question no and this is going to return some bytes no yes yes this is going to return I need to get into the habit of doing these um, function annotations. I presume if I do the base, the uh, the rest will be annotated. Things that inherit from it, I suppose. Which are cool. And self dot identifier by. Now we don't need to pass it in here. So our init can just be a pass statement for now. Does a class in Python have reflection over its own name? If so, you could use that and cut off the instruction and save yourself from repeating. Um, yeah. I don't know. Good question gonna do this and then I'll come back and answer that. The the reason I do it is coming from I've just come off the back of doing some Java programming, so I'm in the you know, verbose world, but you're right, it's probably a bit overkill. To um that is to have the uh, LDA instruction be called LDA instruction. Just call it LDA. Alright, um so we're gonna copy this and then we're gonna do some really stuff. So this is actually not right. Fuck. It'll do. So LDA is A9, SEI 7, 8, and CLD is going to be a D8. Cool. So now instead of doing this instruction mapping, instructions. So we can define what instructions does this CPU support. Again, we might put this somewhere different, but and then we can do self dot instruction mapping is a default dict. So this is going to be a bit of a dodgy way of doing it, but we're just going to append
instructions dot. So we're going to define what our instructions are, and then we're going to. No, I was talking about the name tag. Interesting. If I look at SEI instruction, does the class have reflection over its own name? I yeah, I don't know. That is a great point. It does have reflection over its own name. All right, um, that's gonna save us some. Some time. Perfect. So the name function will return the name of the class, which means we don't need to manually specify what the instruction is called. Um, yeah, this is just going to save us code and time, which is which is the dream. Um, I'm hoping that eventually as well that these instruction lengths will be set by the mix-ins. So presumably, you will inherit from like a single byte instruction or whatever, which is going to be a mix-in, you know, something like that. And then that will set the instruction length and determine how to pull data out and stuff like that for you. Yeah, thanks, Skatex. That's true. All right. Um, yeah, so now we want to set an instruction mapping and put an entry for the identifier byte. So sorry, to, to come back to this, so what I'm doing is I'm going to define which instructions are available and then I'll just put them into a dictionary so I can map out of them later just by making it a default dictionary so we can put in random entries, map it by its identifier byte and set it to be that instruction. These are actually not instructions, these are instruction classes. Instruction class mapping. So for instruction class, self dot instruction classes, instruction class mapping should be the instruction class dot identifier by should equal the instruction class. Cool. All right. Um, let's think about that a bit more. So this should be instruction class mapping. We'll get this instruction class and now we don't need to pass in that byte that byte thing because it knows what its byte is to be honest these might not need to store state so potentially I could just initialize them can't initialize remove that name thing there. Cool. Alright. Format. Self.name. SEI instruction has no thing name. Ah. Damn. Yeah, okay. Oh no. No, no. It's just not a function. Oh, no. Didn't work. So that's a property of the class. Can we access our class? I wonder if that's the way to do it. That seems ugly, but... Alright, so we access our class to get our name. Alright, so if I restart this... We have an SEI, a CLD, an LDA, and then we actually have three more SEIs. Cool. Sweet. All right. I think that's a pretty good place. I might stop there and come back. So we've got the ROM is being the ROM is being read in. Instructions are being. Our bytes are being read in, mapped to instructions. 
and then the instructions can define <coughs> how much to implement the program counter and we're actually starting to iterate through through the ROM. So the next step will be to implement a lot more of these instructions and to start doing them a bit smarter. So to start using some mix-ins and do um, and, and do kind of how we read things through that and how instruction length gets determined through that instead of specific specifying it. Um, yeah, sweet. I think this is pretty, pretty cool. All right, so I'm going to, all right, let's see. Uh, why aren't we passing in the bytes anymore? Uh, yeah, we we are doing that. Although I might not have annotated that correctly in all the places. This does return bytes, and I think the ROM returns bytes now as well. Yeah, but we do pass in position. The program count. Ah, sorry, the program counter is an int, but we do receive bytes everywhere else. Yeah. All right. I might um push this up to to git uh, to GitHub. I think this is going to be a git at all kind of job. I'll just push this up to GitHub. Sweet. So if I come back to GitHub now. Yeah, rock on. So we now have a commit. I did do a PyCharm project files with an all commit, but this is the first real commit. Writing in the nest ROM, sending first instructions to the CPU. I might do a um I'll do a tag as well. Just to um get tag. Um do we need quotation marks? I don't know, probably not. So, um, yeah, cap set one. Episode one. Push the tags. All right, and we should have a tag, one release, nice. Um, yeah, so all this code is on the GitHub page, which is linked down the bottom of the Twitch. So if you wanna go take a look and have any ideas or whatever, I might edit this um, this readme. I, I probably don't have time to do it now, but I might do it later, later um, and just do a some information about, you know, some of the links that I've been going through and stuff like that. Some ideas about what this is going to be. Yeah, if you have any have any thoughts or questions or comments or whatever, feel free to shoot them over to, to me. You can message me on, on Twitch or through GitHub or, you know, or whatever. Yeah, thanks for coming and watching. Thank you very much to particularly Kdex for keeping my code, well, might not be clean, but, <laughs> or at least putting in a good effort. For Como Andis, for having some good, some good thoughts early on. Yeah, I'm gonna, uh, 
going to head off. Smiley face indeed. Thanks, Cadex. Yeah, this is the first time I've done something like this, so it's been pretty, pretty fun. All the videos will go up on... There is a YouTube that's going to be linked to this Twitch account. Um, so I'll push the videos up so I'll be recording everything. I will try to do the next stream tomorrow at around the same time. So I started this one around 2.30 GMT. Um, it might be, yeah, I'll try and try and do it. Maybe it might be around 1.30 GMT tomorrow, so around an hour earlier. Which, uh, let me just figure out if I can get a countdown timer to that or something. I'll try and commit to doing it then. Time is actually a really cool site, but I don't know if I can... Time countdown. Not very. It's almost. That seems good to me. Stream. Tomorrow, it's 7.17 a.m., jeez. Um, yeah, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not really set to a, to a streaming time or anything. I kind of, uh, the idea hopefully will be, as long as I'm recording videos, at least people can, can keep up if they want. Hi, Little Brown. Thank you for coming and taking a look. Um, yeah, I, I'm not really, it's at, I'm in Australia, so it's like the middle of the day right here now. It's like 3, 3.18. So I'm pretty, pretty flexible with whenever I stream. It could be also at night, which has been around 4 hours. But probably somewhere in this 8 hours or something. We'll have to check out YouTube. Awesome. Um, hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. Oh, yeah. I do kind of want to keep a semi, well, not regular, but at least have some kind of countdown to when something's going to go on. But I'm not 100% sure how I'm going to do that. Hmm. Yeah, if you have any thoughts or any, any ideas on when I should be streaming, I kind of picked this time at a bit random, but... Look, yeah, I'll, I'll probably say for now that I'll, um, I'll stream at a similar time tomorrow. Um, where I started around three hours ago. So I'll probably do that, and then, um, yeah, upload things on YouTube at the very least, and, and yeah, try and do it that way. All right, cool. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. Uh, yeah, I will see you, see you all hopefully sometime soon. Like I said, I think I'll stream it roughly this time tomorrow. Um, maybe a bit of a shorter one. I'll I'll post on Twitch or something as whether I'm going to do that. James Franco. <laughs> I wish. Do you only use Python in your streams, or are we going to get some other programs as well? Just to be curious, as I'm new to this channel. I am also new to this channel. This is my first stream. Um, at the moment, I, I do obviously program in other languages. Uh, at the moment, I think it will be focusing on this one project, which will be making this NES emulator in Python 3. Um, I'm definitely open to doing other programming stuff. I've been doing a bit of bit of Django, which is also Python recently, but a um, bit of Java, doing Android stuff, and I've just come off some doing some C++. So, 
Look, if you have any ideas or any cool projects, um, uh, I'd love to kind of like stick around and stream some stuff. <laughs> like, comment, and subscribe, precisely. I'll sell out sometime soon. But, um, yeah, look, as I said, feel free to shoot me any ideas for cool projects or whatever you have. I'm kind of going to try and push through this one and see where it goes, which is going to all be in Python. But, yeah, I have to see. I kind of have the most experience in Python. Um, so it's all, yeah, it's probably the language I'm most familiar with. But, like I said, got any cool ideas? This Ness project will probably run for God knows how long, but I, I'm guessing since I've never done an emulator before, <coughs> made some good progress today, but I'm willing to bet that there's going to be some, uh, yeah, some issues that we run into in the future. And I don't think that I'm going to try to do all the coding for it on stream. Um, just because it seems like a fun thing to do, get to hang out with some people. So yeah, so it might take a while. So it might be a while before anything else happens, to be honest. A little round. Yeah. All right. Cool. Cool indeed. I will uh, see people. See people tomorrow. Yeah. Thanks for watching the stream.